All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here today. We're going to start in about one more minute just to let some more people hop on. And just to let you all know, if you get disconnected for any reason or something takes you away, this will be recorded. It's being recorded right now, and it will live on the Natural History Museum's YouTube page. So if you can't be with us the whole time or something takes you away, not to worry. You can watch it all on YouTube. So we're going to give it just a couple more seconds, and we will begin. Thank you. All right, I think it's time to begin. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today on World Ocean Day for this super exciting and very, very important conversation about ocean plastics and microplastics with Dr. Britta Beckler from the Ocean Conservancy, which is a fascinating organization that uses science and education to teach people about how to better protect and to uh, promote a healthy and thriving ocean environment. So thank you, Dr. Britta Beckler, for being here today. I would also like to start by thanking Nickelodeon. Um, they are partners in hosting this series. And with their help, every Tuesday and Thursday, some of the museum educators from the Natural History Museum will be talking with a marine science expert um, just having these kind of casual, kid-friendly conversations with scientists about ancient sponges and fascinating fish and sea snails like Gary. So that's going on all month with the help of Nickelodeon. And before we begin our actual presentation, we do have a little bit of a video to show you just to kick off this series. So let's queue up that video and we'll get started. In honor of World Oceans Day, Nickelodeon is partnering with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and Ocean Conservancy to learn all about the science of SpongeBob. I wish to learn at the feet of the master! And while things may seem great down in the deep blue sea, life is good! There are actually several threats to our ocean due to climate change and pollution. In fact, every minute, more than a garbage truck worth of plastics enter our aquatic ecosystem. People that litter really bug me. This is a big problem. Since the ocean covers over 70% of the Earth's surface, not to mention the ocean produces half of the oxygen that we breathe. Really? Yes, really. So let's check in with some of the museum's top scientists to hear what they have to say. With all of the humans on Earth, right, nearly around 8 billion of us. Although the ocean is large, it's not so large that it completely dilutes our pollution and our plastic trash. If we can cut down on buying plastics and not creating such a demand, that would help. Someone start separating their recycling. Let's ride. <laughs> Microplastics are very tiny pieces of plastic, and they are pervasive throughout the environment. They mostly come from runoff or from people just leaving trash in the ocean. Don't try to eat it. It's plastic. Microplastics are found everywhere. They're finding it in the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest place on Earth. And they're finding it not only in the trench, but they're finding it in animals. <laughs> Yeah, got that right. But are there any examples of ways humans have been able to help the ocean? An example of a conservation success story are baleen whales. They were hunted so much that the different species could not keep up. But in the 60s, people started worrying about whales. They started protecting them, and populations have mostly, for the most part, bounced back. So change is possible. Use your voice. Talk to your friends, family, and classmates about ways to be more climate friendly. If all of us could reduce our impact on the ocean um, by using less plastic and making sure that our trash goes where it's supposed to would help the ocean be a healthier place for the animals that live there. These small steps 
can make a big difference in saving our ocean and keeping Bikini Bottom beautiful. If we're gonna get out of this, we gotta work together. Check back in for more Science of SpongeBob, brought to you by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and Nickelodeon. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So you might be wondering, um, who are we? So we do have a slide for this with our headshots on it. So this is us. My name is Justin Ramos, and I am an educator at the Natural History Museum. And I am joined today by Dr. Britta Beckler. She is the Senior Manager of Ocean Plastics Research at the Ocean Conservancy. Dr. Britta is amazing and fascinating. She earned her doctorate in environmental science and also lives and works in Portland, Oregon. She joins us now from seemingly the bottom of the ocean. Uh, welcome, Dr. Br Dr. Britta. Hi, thanks. Uh, yes, I'm calling in from the real life bikini bottom today. Thanks, thanks for having me, Justin. Yeah, of course. So to begin, um, as you, Dr. Britta, and as I'm sure that anyone who's ever been to a beach can tell you, there's a lot of trash, both in the ocean and on the beach. And this fact is even referenced in the SpongeBob episode called High Sea Diving, where basically SpongeBob wants to become a championship high sea diver, which is where you dive up towards the surface instead of um, down towards the ocean floor. So with the help of these balloons, here we have some images from the actual episode. SpongeBob, he floats to the top and he thinks he's gonna reach the surface, but then he bumps into this just giant collection of ocean garbage, which we can see here in this picture from the episode. We see um, just lots of bottles and bottle caps and what looks like a sandal or something. And as he keeps kind of bumping into it, it dislodges and it falls down towards Bikini Bottom and the residents of Bikini Bottom think that it's some sort of uh, gift from the ocean gods, but really it's just ocean trash. So even though this is an episode of SpongeBob, Dr. Britta, what can you tell us about the real life plastic problem that we have in the ocean? Yeah, thank, thank you, Justin. Um, I'm here today, unfortunately, um, to talk about the plastic problem in our ocean. So let's get started talking about sort of how, how we got here. So actually, if we're to turn back our clocks uh, to the 1800s, um, plastics were actually first created to sort of help animals in, in a way. Uh, they were created to replace ivory that was used in billiard balls, which was a really popular sport apparently in the 1800s. And as we know, elephant tusks are made of ivory. So, uh, the plastic was, was supposed to be a substitute for that ivory. But as we all know, uh, there's, there's now a plastic problem. So this is a picture out of a magazine from maybe when, if there are kids joining, when your parents or possibly even your grandparents uh, were, were around. This picture from Life Magazine in 1955 uh, is sort of when plastic started really being heavily produced. And as you can see, this family here is so excited. They've discovered disposable plastics and now they don't have to do dishes in their household is what the article's about. Um, so they're really happy, but having the foresight living in 2021, we know that this was actually not good for our environment. So how much plastic do we make? Um, this picture here just shows that there has been a really sharp increase in the amount of plastics we make every single year since about that 1950s point. Uh, this is in millions of tons of plastics produced per year. And again, you can just see it's a really sharp increase. The red line on this graph showing that only about 9% of the plastics we produce are recycled. So there's a huge gap between what we're able to recycle and reuse and sort of what gets thrown away or what might enter the environment. So I know some of you are on summer break right now, but we're gonna take a quick quiz, a one question quiz to test your knowledge about plastics. So here we have a plastic water bottle. On the bottom of it is a number one with some arrows and a triangle. Um, and your question today is, what does the number on the bottom of this plastic drink bottle mean? 
So I'll give you a few seconds to talk amongst your families at home. What do you think it means? Take a quick second. Okay. The answer to the quiz is the number one means simply that the bottle is a type one plastic. Um, some of you at home might have said the one means it's recyclable because I see the recycling symbol, but actually that may not be the case depending on where you live. So to decode what that number and what other numbers you see on the bottom of plastic items might mean, I just wanted to show this chart really quickly. So plastics are categorized generally into seven numbers. Each of those is kind of a bin for a type of plastics. So the number one we just saw indicates that the plastic bottle is made out of polyethylene terephthalate. That's the same plastic that cups and jars and plastic trays might be made out of. However, you know, we all have water running to our homes and pipes. That type of plastic is usually a number three plastic, which is PVC, which we would not drink out of. So while it is really hard to decode plastics, we do have these categories and that's what the actual number on your plastics mean. We now know that about 11 million tons of plastics enter the ocean every year. That is the same weight equivalent of three whole Eiffel Towers every single day. And I don't know if any of you have traveled to France or to Paris before where the Eiffel Tower lives, but it is a huge steel structure. And if you can imagine that amount of plastics being plowed into the ocean every day, it's, it's kind of scary um, and a really big, big amount. So let's envision that this blue cube here is a tiny little ocean environment uh, sitting on our table. If we were to start dropping different types of plastics in it, some plastics would float. If we put a plastic bag, it would float on the surface. If we dropped a little piece of netting, that might sort of settle in the middle not float, not sink. Um, but if we were to drop a plastic soda bottle that did not have a lid on it, that would likely sink to the bottom. Um, and that's because different types of plastic have different densities and different properties, which sort of make them uh, distribute in the water column differently. And so these different types of plastics might impact animals differently too. When those plastics enter the ocean, they're at the surface, they're subjected to sunlight, they're subjected to salt and waves and tiny little organisms that start to decay those plastics and wind and a bunch of other factors. And what that does is makes the plastic really brittle so that it starts breaking down into these tiny, tiny pieces called microplastics. Good job. These microplastics and the bigger pieces of plastics they broke down from start to accumulate in these big gyres out in the ocean. Uh, like Justin was talking about at the beginning, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's located um, in the Pacific Ocean and is comprised of the North Pacific and South Pacific gyres. But those are basically big spinning gyres of trash uh, that are primarily made out of microplastics actually, um, and can be really dangerous places for animals to live because of all the plastic. But let's dive into specifically microplastics right now. So if you're to take a look at your, your finger here, um, microplastics can only be as big as about half the width of your finger. So they're not very big at all. And some of them are so small that you can't even see them. Some plastics are made in a factory to be that size specifically. The first type is called a nurdle which is one of my favorite words, least favorite things. Um, if you could say nurdle at home with your family, that's a good word to learn. But nurdles are basically just small pieces of plastic that we melt down to form the things we use in our lives like toothbrushes and laundry detergent bottles. Um, there are also microbeads, which we use in face scrubs and actually in deodorants and toothpastes, which is kind of crazy, um, styrofoams, like if you have a bean bag, it would be filled with styrofoam beads. And unfortunately, glitter is also another type of microplastic. Other types of microplastics break down from bigger plastics. Like if you were to find a GI Joe arm 
on the beach, that would be a fragment or a fiber that comes off of your clothing in the laundry. Uh, a film can be from a plastic bag and then phones can break down from things like styrofoam cups. So where the heck do these things come from? Um, you know, fishing is really important around the world for us to get fish, but when gear is lost, it's largely made out of plastic and it can start to break down into microplastics. You've probably seen plastic on beaches that's starting to break down. Um, even though it never goes away, it does get smaller and smaller. Microplastics can come from those products we're using in the shower and also from our washing machines, which seems like kind of a tricky one. So did you know that when we wash our clothes at home, they can actually cause plastic pollution? And that's because one load of laundry, if you're wearing clothes that are made out of synthetics, which are a lot of the clothes that we own now, that can produce almost a million microplastic fibers that are then transmitted into the environment. So what happens is the water in our machine is whisked out through pipes to a treatment plant, pushed through a screen, and then unfortunately, some of that passes through the screen and does end up in the ocean or our rivers. So they can make their way into our rivers. They can be at the surface of big lakes. They are found at the bottom of the ocean in the Marianas Trench, which as you learned in the video, is the deepest part of the ocean. They're actually so small and light that they can be transported through wind onto glaciers in the most remarkable remote parts of the world, and they're also found uh, in coastal areas as well. <clears throat> so when these microplastics make their way into the water or the environment, obviously animals are living there and they do start to take them in. Um, and these are just sort of pretend figures of what a fiber might look like or a fragment, um, a fragment being a, a piece that would break off from a large plastic. And as you can see with that fragment, it does have some sharp edges. So if an animal takes that in, it can start to hurt their insides because it's sharp. A fiber, because it's smooth, might sort of get entangled inside of the animal that consumes it. The other thing about plastics is when they're made, we incorporate all kinds of chemicals because we need different types of plastics in our lives. So, if you, if you think of all the plastics in your kitchen or in your bathroom, they're probably different colors, they're different shapes. Um, some of them are flexible, some of them are hard, uh, and those are all because of chemical properties. Plastics are also really good in the environment. They're like little pieces of Velcro that just absorb chemicals that are in the water. So the plastics that an animal takes in can have chemicals in it and chemicals on it that can ultimately affect the animal that eats it. Yes, so Dr. Britta, thank you for all of that fascinating information. But I do have a question and I also wanna uh, remind everyone that they can also submit their questions in the chat feature of the Zoom because we will be having time for question and answer. So if y'all have anything you wanna ask Dr. Britta, don't forget you can type that in the chat. But my question is, so we've learned about how microplastics form and kind of what they are and where they end up, but how could they affect some of our good friends who live in Bikini Bottom? Like how do they affect uh, sponges and snails and whales and all that stuff? Hey, that's an awesome question, Justin. Let's, let's dive in and learn more about some of your favorite uh, Bikini Bottom characters. So here we have a few. Um, just to, just to set you up, you all know what Bikini Bottom looks like, but it's a beautiful underwater environment. And we're gonna go there now, learn some more about the, the folks that live there. So who am I for this when you're at home? Shout out to your family if you know the name of this character. Who am I? This here is Sheldon J. Plankton, who we also know as Plankton. Um, and this is a picture here of what plankton would look like in real life. He's actually a copepod, which is a type of plankton. Um, on the show, plankton is always causing trouble by trying to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula. Um, but in real life, plankton are some of the most important creatures in the sea. They're tiny, some are as small as a red blood cell, which are hard to see with the naked eye. 
Um, plankton are at the base of the food chain, meaning they're really important in supporting the diets of all of the other creatures in the sea. Despite being so small, plankton are still affected by microplastics. Scientists that have scooped plankton out of the ocean have found microplastics inside of their bellies. Um, and so those plastics can actually ultimately affect the survival, um, which is bad on its own, but because so many other creatures eat the plankton, it leads to microplastics getting into the diets of many, many other ocean animals. Okay, moving on to another character living on Bikini Bottom. This is a little bit a hard one to identify. So if you know the name, definitely shout it out. And if you get it right, pat yourself on the back. This is Clamu. <laughs> so on the show, Clamu can be found at the Bikini Bottom Zoo performing tricks for her fans. But in real life, Clamu is actually an oyster. We might know oysters as food or because they produce pearls, but they're some of the hardest working animals in the ocean. In fact, they help keep our water clean and can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. Now think if you were filtering 50 gallons of water per day, that is an awful lot of water. So they're really hard workers. Um, and unfortunately, where there's water, there are often microplastics and scientists have found microplastics, including fibers that come from our clothing inside of oysters and clams. Next character here, I bet most of you know his name. Here we have, awesome, Squidward Tentacles, also known as Squidward. Um, so we all know him as the grumpy clarinet playing neighbor and coworker of SpongeBob. Um, and actually in real life, while his name is Squidward, he is actually not a squid at all, he's an octopus. So octopus are definitely some of the coolest critters in the sea. They're super smart. They can change colors to disguise themselves from predators. And some have, have even been known to play with toys. Um, unfortunately, we've also seen examples of octopi playing with plastic items in the wild. So there, there was a video of an octopus playing with a littered plastic cup that went viral um, a couple of years ago. So they're not immune from plastics in the ocean either. This person or individual, we have Mr. Crab. Uh, so on the show, Mr. Crab runs the world famous Krusty Crab, which is home of the which famous sandwich? The Krabby Patty, awesome. Um, in real life, he's a crab. Uh, there are several types of crab species he could be. Um, in real life, crabs are an extremely diverse group of crustaceans found around the world. They can spend time on land, in salt water, on fresh water, and can be almost any color. Um, crabs, like other critters, are subjected to microplastics in their environments, which scientists have shown can change their behaviors, can make them grow more slowly, and ultimately impact their survival too. And because crabs are bottom feeders, they're likely to take in microplastics through their foods, that have sunk to the ocean floor and been embedded in whatever they're eating. So we have three more SpongeBob characters to talk about. This one, if anyone knows the name, it's tricky. Here we have Flats the Flounder. So there, there are many fish characters living in Bikini Bottom. Um, you might recognize Flats the Flounder from the episode where he tries to fight SpongeBob. Um, as you know, fish are very important animals in the ocean, not only because they're beautiful to look at, but also because they're an important part of, part of the food chain, um, including for those of us that eat fish for dinner. I'm one of them. Um, because fish breathe by passing water over their gills, when there are microplastics in the water, they breathe those in too. Many fish eat plankton or smaller fishes. Um, this can cause microplastics that are found in those prey items to move up the food chain into predators. Um, in fact, 60% of all fish sampled around the world have been shown to have microplastics in their bodies. Who's this? This here is Tony the turtle, a green sea turtle. 
Um, there's only been one sea turtle um, on SpongeBob so far, and his name is Tony. You might recognize him from the episode where it's revealed that his shell is actually Patrick's house. Sea turtles are affected by plastics from the time they are born until the time they're adults. So when baby turtles hatch, they have to make their way to the ocean. And unfortunately, sometimes they have to climb over plastics in order to make it to the water. Um, as adults, they sometimes confuse plastic bags for their favorite food, which are jellyfish, and accidentally eat the bags. And what happens then is the bags get stuck in their stomachs and cause some really big problems for the poor turtles. And plastic straws have also been found lodged deep into the nostrils of some sea turtles, which is another illustration of how our plastics that we use in our daily lives are directly affecting the ocean animals that we love. All right, and our last SpongeBob character today, who am I? She's a favorite of mine. This here is Pearl. So Mr. Crab's teenage daughter isn't actually a crab at all. She's a sperm whale. This is Pearl, one of the biggest fish in the sea. So we now, that, we now know that more than 800 species of ocean animals are affected by plastics from the tiniest plankton like we talked about all the way to the largest whales. There are many different types of whales and many of those have huge mouths. So not only do they take in microplastics, but they can also consume big plastic pieces as well. So one sperm whale was found washed up on a beach in Scotland with over 200 pounds of plastic in its stomach. Um, another sperm whale was found on an Indonesia beach with 100 plastic cups, four plastic bottles, 25 plastic bags, and two flip-flops in its stomach. So obviously there's a big plastic problem for the residents of Bikini Bottom um, and also for animals throughout the entire ocean. And we living on earth are also not immune to microplastics, unfortunately. They're found in the air that we breathe, whether we're indoors or outdoors because they're so small, they're airborne and we do take them in. Um, and like the animals we just talked about and the characters, uh, microplastics are present in our foods. So we do also take those in through the foods that we eat and even the water that we drink. All right, Dr. Britta. So honestly, all of that information is a little bit um, scary and honestly a little bit sad, right? And it seems like a massive huge problem but my question is and, and this is a very important question is what can we as you know students and kids and friends and families and educators what can we everyday people do about these things to help out i'm really glad you asked that justin because i think that's one of the most important things for us to learn about we know that there's a problem now uh, that's been taking place since the 1950s, but we all are on this call because it's World Ocean Day and we wanna be able to help solve this problem. So what exactly can we do about it? So today's solutions are brought to you by the letter R. So the first solution we'll talk about is this R that stands for refuse. So how can we refuse plastics in our daily life to help solve the problem? of plastics in our environment. A couple of things you can do just in your daily life um, is if you're out at a restaurant with your family or getting food from a food cart, um, you can ask for no straw. That's one way where you can just straight up refuse plastics right when they're offered to you. And this is great because you know many of us don't need straws for our beverages. They already come in cups or in a can. Um, so simply refusing that straw means that it's not likely to get into the environment because you're not using it. So that's one great action you can take. Another one is when you're at the grocery store with your families, if there are options of, you know, blueberries packaged in a, in a plastic clamshell or in this paper box, you can choose the option that doesn't have any plastic. And that's the same as you refusing plastic that day. So I love to purchase 
produce at my local farmer's market. It's summertime, there's really great berries and other types of fruits. So I try to practice this when I go and it feels really good to come home with something that I know I can recycle and, or reuse. So reduce, how do we reduce plastics in our daily lives? So again, it's summertime, it's hot out. All of us need to be staying hydrated. Um, so wherever we go, we're gonna need some water. And instead of stopping by grocery stores or gas stations to buy plastic water bottles throughout the day, it's really great if you can carry a reusable water bottle with you. Um, and that way you're not only refusing plastics, but you're, you're using something that's reusable. Um, similarly, if you're going out to eat, you can carry reusable utensils, which are fun and they look really neat. Uh, if you want a straw, you can carry a reusable. Um, and if you're going to the grocery store, there are tons of really fun, colorful, reusable bags you can bring. Repurpose, how do we repurpose plastics in our daily lives for the, the products that we do have at home? This is one of my favorites because you can really get creative um, with any sort of art project or, or any sort of um, contraption in your home, like making a bird feeder out of this plastic bottle or making a garden um, with these plastic bottles as well. You can have art projects, you can sort of do whatever tickles your fancy with whatever you have at home. Um, and it's a great way to repurpose these plastics so they don't go directly to landfill or directly to a recycling facility. Um, so this is an awesome way to get your creative juices grow growing with your family. Represent, this might be a hard one to understand, but how do we sort of represent the animals we care about in our ocean in our daily lives? And how does that have to do with plastics? So big problems need big fixes. Um, we need big solutions. There's a lot we can do as individuals. And at the end of the day, companies and governments also need to step up to help us really solve the plastic problem. So one way that you can make a difference is to learn about what laws will protect the ocean and help make them a reality. So one proposed law that's being brought to Congress in Washington, DC is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. This act would ban certain types of plastics that we know harm our ocean like plastic bags, foams, containers, and straws throughout all of America. It would also make recycling much easier and more effective. So definitely talk to your friends and family members uh, about supporting this bill. And you can go to oceanconservancy.org to find out ways you can help advocate for it as well. The next R is restore. So how do we restore our environment that's so heavily affected by plastics right now? Uh, for more than 35 years, Ocean Conservancy, who I work for, has mobilized the world's largest beach cleanup effort, uh, which is called the International Coastal Cleanup, or ICC. Um, over those 30-ish years, we've engaged over 15 million people around the planet, who have collected 315 million pounds of trash. And this effort has been spread out over um, about 150 countries. So it's a massive effort and it's really effective um, in picking up the trash that's unfortunately already made its way into the environment. Some of the most commonly collected items we find are these ones here. They're, they're often single use plastics, including cigarette butts, which often are at the very top of our list for, for the most collected item. Other things that are common are straws, bottle caps, cups, etc. The great thing is you can also help clean up your favorite outdoor space as well. So Clean Swell is a mobile app that enables volunteers to log the trash they find directly into our ocean trash index in real time. So this is the world's largest database on marine litter, and it's used to educate and inform scientists, conservation groups, governments, and industry leaders about ocean trash. So we can all work to ensure that the trash never reaches our beaches. Um, this is what the app looks like. You can download it. Um, it can be used anytime, anywhere. Even if you're just walking your dog around the block, taking it to the park, you can use Clean Swell 
to collect and track the types of trash you're finding and really help make a difference to our ocean. And this is what we do with the data. Volunteers log what types of products they find in our CleanSwell app. That goes into our trash index. And the trends we see in different types of trash are really important to help us inform policy. For example, we just started tracking uh, disposable masks and gloves because of the COVID pandemic. And we've learned a lot of interesting things about where, that data, where the uh, PPE litter is um, and how we might be able to stop that from entering our environment. The last R we'll talk about today is recycle, which hopefully some of us are familiar with. And one great way you can help contribute to the solution is learn how to recycle plastics in your neighborhood. Um, it can actually be kind of confusing figuring out which exact plastics are recyclable. That can differ by city, municipality, county, state. Um, there are a lot of different rules based on what technologies are available. So learning what number plastics can be recycled, remember that list of seven, uh, and what forms of plastics as well uh, can really help so that you're not accidentally putting non-recyclables into your recycling bin and vice versa, not accidentally throwing away recyclables uh, that could otherwise be uh, go through the recycling loop again. So what I like to do when I wake up in the morning, uh, I'm concerned about the plastic pollution problem often. So I like to wake up and think, you know, today I'm gonna think hard about how I use plastics. And I hope you do as well. That's a really great way to make the planet happy and the animals we care about. Um, and it's something to think about on World Ocean Day. Here's just one more reminder of all the different actions we talked about that you can participate in every day. Um, again, thanks for, thanks for taking the time and for really learning about each of these actions. I'm sure some of you will go out and adopt them very soon. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Britta. I know I will. I'm gonna download uh, Clean Swell right after this and Great. dig out my old metal straw that I have somewhere. <laughs> But now I do. Glad to hear it. Yeah, so thank you for all that amazing information. And it's really kind of heartening to know that there are things that we can do about it. And thanks for telling us about how we can be um, solutions to this, to this very big problem. But now um, I've asked you some questions and we're gonna open it up to questions that have been submitted to us. Um, so I'll be reading those to Dr. Britta and see what she has to say about these things. I'll set a little bit of a timer just to keep us on track here, but we do have several questions. So let me start off with, this one is from, I'm sorry if I uh, say this wrong, Nakema, Lila, Avi, and Mac. And they commented in the Zoom presentation and they would like to know, are all plastics bad? Have they come up with an eco-friendly kind of plastic? That is a really great question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, and as someone that works in a conservation organization, it is it is easy to think, you know, plastics equal bad. But you know, having now lived through a global plant pandemic, I know that plastics have a lot of really important functions as well. Uh, like they protect us with gloves and all of the personal protective equipment that we've been using over the past year. They're really important uh, in the medical field. They make, you know, automobiles and airplanes lighter when you're adding plastics relative to other materials. So no, not all plastics are bad. Um, but I will say, in my opinion, most, if not all plastics that enter the environment are bad because there are implications for how that's harming different ecosystems and different organisms. Um, we need to be able to manage the plastics that we do use in our daily lives, sending them to appropriate treatment facilities like, like recycling so that we can reuse them and that we don't have to continually be taking oil out of the ground to make new plastics. So that's a really good question. Um, and in terms of alternatives to plastics, there have been a lot of 
um, advancements in materials that are that can be used to replace plastics. So those that include uh, biofeedstocks like corn or starches or even waste agricultural products, those are good. Um, but we really do need to do a, a lot more research on what the impacts of those alternatives would have on animals as well. Um, and then it's also important to know that some plastics that we use really don't need to be replaced at all. Uh, some are just unnecessary to begin with. <laughs> like one of my least favorite plastics are probably those individual plastic flossers. I don't know if you know what those are. It's basically this much floss on this much plastic. Um, in my opinion, that's something that's unnecessary. So some things can just be eliminated, but others do need replacement. So that's a really good question. Thank you. All right, thank you for that answer. We have another one coming in from Madeline. And Dr. Britta, what is your favorite ocean animal? That's such an awesome question. Um, it, it depends on the environment. So I've been lucky to dive on reefs that look, look like the environment right behind me, but I also grew up in Alaska um, and have learned to appreciate animals there. They're very different, um, but I would say my, my favorite sort of cold water ocean animal is the octopus. They're so smart. Um, I've seen a lot of documentaries that just bring out their individual personalities. They're really cool. I'm amazed that they can fit through such tiny spaces, uh, you know, the size of their beak. So I love uh, octopus as, as would be my favorite cold water ocean animal. Um, and in terms of warm water ocean animals, I love eels. <laughs> I think they're really fantastic. They, they live deep inside of coral reefs. They just have their head poking out most of the time. They're very alert um, and they're predators and they're smart as well. So octopus and eels are kind of my, my favorites, but it's really hard to choose. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Madeline. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more quick um, question and answer. And this one is from the sun. It's about something that we can all probably um, work to improve on. What is the best straw alternative? That's a great question. Um, it sort of depends if, if a straw is something that you need to be using, um, you know, there are lots of different kinds. And I would say the best alternative, again, if you need a straw is sort of what's available to you. Um, some of them can be really pricey. I've seen beautiful glass straws, um, but there are more inexpensive metal straws. So really what's available to you and what's affordable and what you will carry around is probably the best. Um, but again, if you don't need a straw, I would say the best type is one that doesn't exist. Uh, you know, give it a try not using a straw at all. Um, and that way we can avoid needing any type of material to get our beverage from our cup to our mouths. But awesome question, thank you. All right, Dr. Britta, I do believe it is 1145 and that just about wraps up our question and answer segment as well as our webinar. So uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank you, Dr. Britta Baker from the Ocean Conservancy, um, just for taking the time to talk with us today and give us all these recommendations for things that we can do to help out with this big problem. Thanks so much for having me. Happy World Oceans Day. I hope everybody's able to get outside, uh, maybe to a coastline and just enjoy, enjoy the beauty of the ocean. Thank you so much. I totally agree. I would also like to thank Nickelodeon, our partner in this for helping us host this event. We hope everyone learned something about maybe one of their favorite bikini bottom characters and also the things that we can do to keep them safe, healthy, and happy so that they can continue having, you know, those wacky and insane adventures. So also don't forget, there is more science of SpongeBob that the Natural History Museum is exploring. We have videos, we have activities, we have virtual events, all on nhm.org forward slash SpongeBob. And lastly, we would like to thank all of you for joining us here today on this World Ocean Day. We hope to see you again this Thursday at 11 a.m., where we will be talking about Gary the Sea Snail with the Natural History Museum's own 
malacologist, which is someone who studies snails, Dr. Jan Vendetti. Until then, we hope you all might take a closer look at your individual plastic usage and some of the ways that you might play a part in the recovery to our great oceans. Thank you so much for tuning in.